What's up you guys, Dr. Gooden here with another video lecture. This time we're talking about performance enhancing substances and we'll talk about both the illegal and the legal varieties. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology here at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this lecture, we are talking all about ergogenic aids. Ergogenic, we'll define that here in a minute. But essentially, we're talking about things that enhance performance, things that you ingest, put into your own body that can improve performance. Now, we'll talk about both substances that need to have a doctor's prescription and that are usually illegal without that in most sporting venues and arenas. And we will also talk about perfectly legal dietary supplements that you can take that possibly are efficacious for boosting performance. If you stick around until the end, we'll go through all of those in this video. So let's dive right into the material. Now this all comes from chapter 11 of the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning textbook put out by the NSCA, and this chapter was written by Dr. Bill Campbell. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is define the term ergogenic aid. An ergogenic aid is any substance, mechanical aid, or training method that improves sport performance. For the purposes of this chapter, the term refers specifically to pharmacologic aids. Okay, so things that you take that are some sort of drug or hormone that alters your body's physiology. Now, we can also consider dietary supplements to be ergogenic aids as well. And as I said, by the end of the video, we'll have gone through a lot of different dietary supplements, at least the ones that are listed here in chapter 11 from this textbook. Now, the key point here is that an athlete's first priority should be to apply sound principles of training, including adequate nutrition, uh, before using any nutritional supplement or ergogenic aid. Before purchasing or consuming a product, an athlete should seek guidance from qualified professionals, that's worth underlining, to make sure that the choice is both legal and effective. So the legality and the, and the effectiveness of the supplement are both equally important. Probably more so the legality of it, because if you take something that's not effective but it's legal, then at least you're not going to get banned from your sport or get any sort of suspension. Now, the type of qualified professionals that you should be seeking out as an athlete or that you should be referring your athletes to as a strength coach um, are registered dietitians or sports dietitians or sometimes physicians. Now, we want to make sure that we're checking the banned substance list if your athletes compete in the NCAA or the NAIA here in the States in the collegiate system for both of those, or if they are an Olympic athlete competing under the uh, World Anti-Doping Agency standards or the guidelines put out by the International Olympic Committee, there's a lot of different standards that you need to check and be sure of uh, before proceeding with that dietary supplement or ergogenic aid. Now, anything that requires a doctor's prescription and that is intended for medical use only pretty much is off the table. However, there are some rare cases where uh, perhaps an athlete can get a prescription for something like that. That is, let's say, legit with air quotes around it. But as strength coaches, we want to be sure that our athletes are first training effectively, that they have good periodized programs, that they have solid nutrition, that their recovery is on point. They're getting seven to eight hours of sleep per night with good quality sleep. Stress levels are low. All of these things will affect their performance far more than any dietary supplement that they could take. Now, for a product to be sold as a dietary supplement, it cannot be tobacco, first of all, and tobacco does not enhance performance. Uh, and it has to be intended to supplement the diet, not to replace things in the diet. It must be intended for digestion or ingestion rather, and it cannot be advertised for use as a conventional food or as the sole item within a meal or a diet. So it has to supplement the diet, hence the word dietary supplement. Now here are some products that can be sold and are sold as dietary supplements, vitamins, minerals, herbs or other botanicals. If you live here in California, you you know all about the herb. Amino acids, any substance for use by humans to supplement the diet by increasing total dietary intake of some other substance. It could also be a concentrate, a metabolite, a constituent extract, or a combination of any of the above ingredients. So it's a pretty broad category, a very large, all-encompassing definition. Now, there is a distinction to be made between a drug and a dietary supplement, and that distinction is often linked to FDA approval for safety and effectiveness. Drugs are only approved for people that have specific prescriptions for those drugs from doctors, whereas a dietary supplement can really be taken by just about anybody as long as they have the blessing of their physician. Now, speaking of drugs, let's talk about anabolic steroids 
in hormones. We're not going to go super in-depth here. If you want to know more, you know what? I'm not even going to list where you can find out more about anabolic steroids, but you can find it, just not necessarily in this video. We're just going to give a, a, an overview of them here. Now, anabolic steroids, these are synthetic derivatives of the male sex hormone testosterone. Remember, testosterone is that hormone. Women have it as well, but in much smaller amounts. That is responsible for the secondary sex characteristics of men. Namely, for sport, the ones we care about for sport are increased muscle mass and strength. Now, elevations in testosterone concentrations stimulate protein synthesis, which result in improvements in muscle size, body mass, and strength. Research has found that over and over again. On the right, we see a chart of different types of anabolic steroids used by athletes that have been used over the years. And since this textbook was published in 2015, uh, there, there have been more uh, synthetic derivatives that have come out. We see on the left side the generic name or category of the steroid, and on the right side, examples of the trade names, what they might be sold under. For instance, Anavar, which is used by athletes both in strength sports and professional athletes and in fighting sports, the generic name or the category is oxandrolone. And this is an orally active steroid, which means that you can ingest it. You don't have to shoot it into your muscle, right? You can shoot them into the deltoid or into the glute if they are not ingestible. So these orally active steroids that are ingestible, they do have to pass through the liver and they do cause more liver damage. Injectable steroids tend to be safer. You see this list down here at the bottom. These you inject right into the muscle and then it spreads throughout the body from there. Now, as far as dosing goes, the text claims that athletes typically use anabolic steroids in a stacking regimen. So they take multiple types of anabolic steroid, each of them having its own unique benefits for the athlete, whether it be strength or size or fat loss. I do think, however, that a lot of athletes get into this taking just one type of uh, anabolic at first. Usually the first cycle is just a single type of anabolic that they take either in a pyramid or a block for six to eight weeks, maybe, maybe longer than eight weeks, where they cycle on and then off. And then it's usually not until the second or the third cycle that they start to stack it with multiple anabolics. Now, the reason for stacking is because the potency of an anabolic agent is enhanced when it is consumed simultaneously with another agent. So we're really just looking at the summation of these effects when we get into these stacking protocols. So most users use the drugs for several weeks or months and alternate these cycles with periods of discontinued use. So you'll hear of people going on a new cycle and when they come off of the cycle, they often take a slew of other types of drugs to stem the withdrawal effects and to get their body producing its own natural testosterone again. Because when you're taking exogenous testosterone or synthetic derivatives of testosterone, your, your body's own testosterone production shuts down. Now, you may be under the perception that only the, the top athletes, like Olympic athletes, professional athletes, use anabolic steroids. In reality, we've found that athletes of all levels have used anabolic steroids, even down to the high school level, which is, I mean, it's not great. Whether or not you consider it ethically or morally wrong, I mean, it is against the rules of fair play. For these younger athletes, they already have puberty on their side, a ton of testosterone circulating through their bodies which will make them highly adaptable to strength and power training. So, um, so it's just really sad that we do see high schoolers resorting to this. However, uh, that's what we see. We see it at, at all levels. Now, many users are not even involved in sports. If you're familiar at all with the bodybuilding world and you know this, there are enhanced divisions and quote unquote natty divisions. And then there's al always the fake natties, like people who claim to be natural, but who are not natural, who are actually using steroids. And, you know, it's a whole thing. However, it's important to know that people use it for both of those reasons, for looks and for performance. Now, here is a graph from research put out by Forbes et al. And this is showing eight weeks of use of decadurabolin. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not really sure. Versus a placebo over eight weeks of use. And you can see that after eight weeks of use, the steroid users gain significantly more fat-free mass than the placebo users. And even after six weeks of cessation, there's still a rather large difference between that fat-free mass that was gained. Now, the ergogenic benefits of testosterone use or anabolic steroid use is dependent upon the training age and the training status of the individual. For instance, newbies, people who are hitting the gym for the first time or who are new athletes and just begin training, oftentimes the changes that they might experience if they were to take anabolics aren't very much greater than if they just started training 
without anabolics alone. Because the training stimulus so early in your training career it is still pretty massive and there's still a big window of adaptation left for you. However, a well-trained individual who takes uh, some sort of anabolic steroid, now they are enhancing their ability to train. They already have this huge work capacity. They probably have a high adaptive resistance built up, but now they have fresh growth stimulated from these anabolics that they're taking. Now they can train harder and longer with greater intensities and see a much bigger uh, stimulus for adaptation. Now, anabolic steroids have also been associated with psychological effects, some negative effects, such as changes in aggression, arousal, and irritability, right? It can go both ways. Uh, there can be depression, or there can be hyperaggression, or both. There can be a lot of arousal, and I'm, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that kind of arousal, not psychological arousal. Um, there could be very high arousal or very low arousal, depending on what your body's own hormones are doing and how they're fluctuating as well. Uh, and then there can also be irritability. You know, everybody's heard the term roid rage, which is, you know, I think it's a little bit blown out of proportion, but it does occur. There are other adverse effects. However, some of these problems may be slightly overstated. The media really loves to latch on to any steroid abuse story and really overhype the adverse effects because it, you know, it just drives the news cycle and it drives our, our, uh, the fear sort of side of our brain. Many effects are linked to the abuse of these drugs, like just taking ungodly amounts and then stopping, right? Once you stop, then your hormones are all out of whack. And if you stop without the proper guidance from a physician, then you get a lot of negative effects, such as gynomastia, which is when men start growing breast tissue and you have to get that surgically removed and it's it's messy and it's gross. If you ever wanna like total gross out uh, for yourself or your friends, just type in like pictures of gynomastia. It's disgusting. Now there's also something called testosterone precursors or pro-hormones. Now these are really not, not very effective. Just go to examine.com and look up pro-hormones and you're gonna find that there's, there's not very much performance enhancement to be had. They could be potentially dangerous. They could possibly be, have been made in a lab that was making other things. And so you might accidentally be consuming um, a banned substance in trace amounts that is detectable. So um, not a good idea to take pro-hormones. Now, HCG is a type of hormone that people will take when they're coming off of a cycle of steroids. So let's say that you are taking a cycle of testosterone for eight weeks, a certain number of milligrams, and your body's own testosterone production is starting to shut down. You come off it after eight, eight weeks, and then you start taking HCG. And what this will do is stimulate the body's own production of testosterone. It increases testicular testosterone production. Now, as far as adverse effects go with HCG, there's very little research on the side effects. However, common side effects that are noted are injection pain, swelling, and tenderness around the injection site. So pretty common side, side effects. Nothing too crazy, but again, it has not been very thoroughly researched. Another hormone that's used often, uh, more often in the bodybuilding world, is insulin. Insulin facilitates the uptake of glucose and amino acids into the cells. If we remember back to exercise physiology, um, insulin is that anabolic storage hormone. Now the claim here is that uh, insulin taken post-workout increases carbohydrate ingestion and suppresses muscle protein breakdown via the anti-catabolic effects um, of insulin. So if you take insulin, now we're getting uh, glycogen repletion, we're getting an anti-catabolic effect, and you're able to ingest much more carbohydrate than you would have otherwise without insulin. Theoretically, if protein breakdown, that anti-catabolic effect, is suppressed over several weeks to months, then gains in lean muscle mass could be realized. Now, insulin has, has a lot of adverse effects, if you, especially if you overdose on it. It's, it can be very dangerous. You have to be very careful with the dosing. Obviously, it's also illegal because um, insulin is created for people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The biggest one is just immediate death, right? You can just, boom, you're out of here. Goodbye, world. <laughs> immediate death if you get that dosing wrong. You can get go into a hypoglycemic coma. Oops, that says oma. There should be a C right there. Coma. Um, and possible development of insulin-dependent diabetes in previously healthy athletes. The next hormone, human growth hormone. We probably remember this one, H HGH from... Barry Bonds and the bad old days of, <laughs> of baseball when we were having all of those home run records broken. But this stimulates both bone and skeletal muscle growth. It helps to maintain blood glucose levels and it stimulates the release of fatty acids from fat cells. So HGH not only will add fat-free mass 
but it will also lean the individual out as well. It will help accelerate their fat burning. There is very little research as far as HGH in athletes goes. It's just like just the ethics aren't really there to do tend to uh, research in athletes because of the potential side effects. Uh, however, research with elderly persons as well as children and adults uh, shows improvements in lean body tissue with decreases in body fat. And I think anecdotally, we've seen from the athletes who have abused HGH and have taken it illegally, you know, we've seen their muscle mass increase, their strength numbers increase. I mean, again, just look at Barry Bonds. Now, some of the adverse effects. Excess HGH after puberty causes acromegaly, which is a disfiguring disease. Again, this is what I was talking about, that widening of the bones, arthritis, organ enlargement, and metabolic abnormality. So it just causes the whole body to grow, not just the muscles. Abuse of HGH can also lead to diabetes in, in people prone to diabetes, cardiovascular dysfunction, muscle joint and bone pain, hypertension, abnormal growth of organs, and accelerated osteoarthritis. So high risk here, high, ri high risk with some reward, especially, especially high risk if you're not having your HGH uh, monitored by a physician. The next one, erythropoietin or erythropoietin, or EPO, or EPO, a lot of different ways to say it. Uh, this, is, this is that endurance, this is the aerobic endurance hormone. Injections of EPO are associated with both elevations in hematocrit and in hemoglobin. Essentially, your oxygen carrying capacity improves dramatically. EPO was the main drug that they tagged Lance Armstrong with taking when he won all of those Tour de France's, and he came back after cancer and was like amazing, and you know, he was on every Nike commercial ever, and then suddenly the truth started to come out. The doping allegations started to come out. Originally, uh, before EPO was developed, blood doping was a thing where endurance athletes would draw their own blood, put them in bags, stick that in the freezer to save it, and then three to six months later, once their body had, had uh, readjusted and created more blood and replaced that blood volume, they would inject it back into themselves. I think sometimes they would spin it down as well just to get the hematocrit, but they, anyways, uh, however they would do it, they would inject it back into themselves and suddenly, ta-da, now, now their oxygen carrying capacity is much improved and it's their own blood. It's, it's, it's ultimately uh, almost undetectable, at least by the standards at that time. Then when EPO was made, now we can just inject it um, and erythropoietin, it stimulates red blood cell production in the bone marrow. So now your body is just creating more of it. The health risks for this include increased risk of blood clotting because you just have so much more hematocrit in the blood, it's, it's thicker, it's more viscous, elevations in systolic blood pressure, compromised thermoregulatory system, and dehydration during aerobic events. And also death, right? There have been people whose hearts have just stopped because the blood is just so thick and as it's pumping, uh, it just, you know, it just can't keep up with that demand and the pressure rises and they just get a heart attack and die mid-race. Now some more hormones. Beta adrenergic agonists, these increase lean mass and decrease stored fat. And beta blockers. Beta blockers reduce anxiety and tremors during performance. Beta blockers keep your heart rate low. So if you have uh, some sort of you know, coronary heart disease and tachycardia where your heart rate is, is going super fast, you might be pre prescribed beta blockers. If an athlete takes beta blockers, yes, their heart rate can't get very high. I think above about 120, but let's say that you are an archer or a shooter, I don't know what you call a shooter, uh, like a, a target shooter, maybe a skeet shooter or something. You need to keep your heart rate low and be able to focus and to breathe and be steady and, and, and to focus on uh, your shots and lining things up. Maybe you're a pool player or you are, um, you know, an athlete that requires a high degree of concentration and skill and not so much speed and agility and power or endurance, then beta blockers might improve your performance. And they're also illegal in most of those sports. All right, you guys, take a deep breath. We just made it through all of the ergogenic aids that we're gonna talk about today. But then second half of this lecture, stay tuned, stick around, because the second half, now we're gonna talk about dietary supplements that you can take that are probably legal, 100% legal in your country, and most likely in whatever sporting federation or program you're competing in. However, check the rules and the bylaws first. And now we're gonna go through those supplements, okay? So the first supplement I wanna talk about is essential amino acids or branched chain amino acids. The textbook calls them essential amino acids, EAAs. Most people call them BCAAs, branched chain amino acids. And these are uh, leucine, isoleucine, and valine are the BCAAs. 
Now, here's how they work in healthy subjects. So you have some sort of a stimulus, probably resistance training. Then we have activation of muscle-specific genes, which then causes an increase in the AKT mTOR pathway, right? That's the anabolic pathway that drives muscle protein synthesis. And then we have a hypertrophic response, meaning that muscles grow in size. Now, during the activation of the mTOR pathway, we have an enhanced leucine uptake. Remember, leucine is one of those amino acids in branch chain amino acids. And then also during that hypertrophic response, we have a synergy between resistance exercise and leucine injection. The key point here is that the branch chain amino acid leucine is a key regulator in stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Leucine directly activates the AKT mTOR pathway in skeletal muscle, which is a pathway in skeletal muscle protein synthesis. So even with, without resistance training, leucine is driving an anabolic response. With resistance training, now you get both the stimulus of the resistance training and the leucine stimulus. And so there's this synergistic response between the two of them. Furthermore, supplementing with EAAs, and most other pu people call them BCAAs, uh, during training helps to prevent tryptophan influx into the brain, which is followed by serotonin production, which causes fatigue. Tryptophan influx is responsible for a lot of that sort of central nervous system fatigue that you start to feel in the back half of your workout. It downregulates the force output and taking BCAAs can help to negate that. Now, that said, BCAAs are expensive and you don't get all of the other amino acids with them. There oftentimes is enough uh, branched chain amino acid content, isoleucine, leucine, and valine in just normal whey protein to stimulate all of this stuff with, without the need to go buy expensive BCAAs, which usually taste like junk, when instead you can have this nice, creamy, smooth whey protein shake, and you get all the other amino acids on top of it as well, and you up your overall protein intake. So personal recommendation, just take whey. You know, if you really want to get granular with it, you can go look at the actual amounts of each amino acid in the ingredients list, but whey will probably take care of it for you. However, if you're rich and you've got money to blow, buy BCAAs. The next dietary supplement to talk about is arginine. Now, the claims for arginine is that it elevates nitric oxide in the blood, it increases blood flow in the muscles, and it improves exercise performance. However, there's little scientific evidence supporting the benefit for athletes or for physically active individuals. It might give you a better muscle pump and it might not. The research is still out on that. The next one, HMB or beta hydroxy beta methyl butyrate. It's kind of a mouthful. I'm not even sure I pronounced that right. Um, it's believed that HMB has both anabolic and lipolytic effects, but research is limited. Uh, there was recently a study that came out and I, I forget the exact name of the study and the authors, but it, was, it had these sort of overblown uh, findings from HMB and it was later retracted. So yeah, the research is kind of it's kind of back and forth on it. Uh, recent research does not support HMB supplementation in resistance trained athletes, unfortunately. Key point uh, here is that HMB is most effective when adequate training stimulus is provided. For untrained individuals, this does not likely require high volume training. For trained individuals, a high intensity, high volume resistance training program is likely needed in order for benefits to be realized with HMB supplementation. So what this is saying is that if you do end up taking HMB, which again, may or may not uh, give you a performance benefit, you probably need to be training in a high intensity type of manner, if, especially if you're a well-trained athlete already. More dietary supplements. Uh, there's a whole class called nutritional muscle buffers these include beta alanine, sodium bicarbonate, and sodium citrate. And essentially what these do is they offset the acidosis, the metabolic acidosis that you feel when you are using your fast glycolytic system. So let's say you're a 400 or 800 meter runner, two events on the track that uh, generate very high amounts of metabolic acidosis. Uh, we usually think of it as lactic acid. You can think of it as the buildup of hydrogen ions. Uh, anyways, these nutritional muscle buffers essentially uh, help to buffer the acidity in the muscles and allow you to run faster for longer or to perform at a higher level uh, during that time that you're performing because they're buffering all of those hydrogen ions. They're accepting them and neutralizing them. And these are effective. However, 
Uh, sometimes they do cause some severe gastrointestinal distress. Okay, time for another funny story. So same guy from my broccoli story from chapter nine, plus my other teammates. So two middle distance runners. This is back in college. These guys were Kines majors. They were going through this actual same exact textbook, but the previous iteration, third edition, I think. And they were reading about nutritional muscle buffers uh, leading up to this time trial that we had to do uh, for the team. And so they're like, oh man, during this, during this 1500 meter time trial, we're going to take a bunch of sodium bicarbonate. So they, they went into the references, they found the studies, they looked at the dosing protocols, and they just copied the dosing protocols, which, you know, I thought that's very resourceful. The thing that they didn't do, though, is they didn't fully read the discussion. In the discussion um, of some of this research, it talked about the intense gastrointestinal discomfort that the participants experienced, some of them experienced, after this dosing protocol, which included both upset stomach and also extreme powerful diarrhea. Okay, I don't think it said powerful, but it said something to that effect. Uh, so they didn't read that part, okay? Long story short, they took the dosage of sodium bicarbonate before the race. We get into this time trial. These guys are just crushing it, right? They're way out ahead of the pack. Three laps in, we have, we're have we about to come through the bell lap. And instead of running through the bell lap uh, and then, you know, turning left, like you're supposed to on a track, both of these guys in tandem just sprinted right off of the track and into the bathrooms that were right next to the track, pulled their pants down, and that was it. That was history. So they didn't finish the race. They ran an exceptional three laps, though, through 1,200 meters. They were on record pace, but they couldn't finish the race. Nutritional muscle buffers, take them with caution. Beta alanine is probably the most agreeable. Uh, that, that one is associated sort of with the tingles. You know, you, if you take too much, you start to feel your face. It's like, you feel like there's ants crawling all over it underneath your skin. It's kind of weird. It's kind of trippy. Okay, now we arrive at creatine. Creatine is an important supplement because it, of its ability to enhance the rephosphorylation of ADP into ATP. The ability to rapidly rephosphorylate ADP is dependent on the enzyme creatine kinase and the availability of creatine phosphate within the muscle. So if you're taking creatine, now you're enhancing the muscle's storage of creatine phosphate by up to approximately 20%. Uh, there is, however, a saturation limit. Now, some individuals are uh, non-responders to creatine, and it's assumed that they're probably already at their saturation limit. However, the vast majority of people do respond positively uh, with powerful ergogenic benefits. Now, these benefits are increases in maximal strength, power, and lean body mass in both trained and untrained populations, which is great because it means no matter where you are in your training journey or no matter what what level your athletes are at, supplementing with creatine is both safe and effective and 100% legal. Additionally, uh, as I just mentioned, it is safe and it's relatively inexpensive. It's a lot cheaper than even protein powder. Now, prolonged creatine supplementation has been generally associated with increases in body weight, especially increases in fat-free mass. Now, that increase in fat-free mass comes over the long term. In the short term, you might notice changes such as additional body weight, uh, due to water. And so sometimes people don't really like how they look with creatine. They might feel more bloated. Personally, I don't notice any bloating. I do notice an uptick in the weight a little bit, but for me, it's well worth the performance uh, enhancement benefits. As far as adverse effects go, controlled studies have been unable to document any significant side effects from creatine supplementation. Um, there are concerns that include gastrointestinal disturbances and strain on the kidneys. However, these are largely unfounded in healthy individuals. Now, you may read about some sort of overblown media hype of some situations where an athlete has a heat stroke or athletes die for some reason and they blame it on creatine. And what happens when you do some digging is that you realize that there were other far more risky things taking place, such as water cuts or sauna, exercising in the sauna for hours on end. Um, trying to make weight for a wrestling match, things like that that are very unhealthy and risky practices, and they also just happen to be taking creatine, and then it's blamed on the creatine. So creatine is, is very safe. It's one of the most well-researched dietary supplements uh, because of how beneficial it is. And so a lot of people start taking it, a lot of high school athletes, and you know, again, we want, we want to make sure that our, especially our younger athletes are safe, and so a lot of research has been done on creatine. And also, this isn't covered in in the slides that I have for you, but it, it also has a very important um, neuroprotective benefit. So with all of the concussion research coming out now with 
uh, traumatic brain injuries, creatine has an important role in actually protecting the brain from those concussions and helping in the recovery process if a concussion does happen. The next dietary supplement is caffeine. And if I could pick just two, I would, always, I would pick creatine and caffeine as my supplements of choice just because of how effective they are, how safe they are, and how cheap they are. Now, caffeine increases your desire to train, it increases time to exhaustion, it decreases the perception of pain that you feel, it, it increases motivation, it can increase neural activation, lower inhibition. It's an amazing, amazing ergogenic aid. The effects on sprint and power performance remain a little bit unclear, especially in the face of the overwhelming uh, benefits that caffeine imparts to endurance performance. However, anecdotally, and and seeing it in, in athletes that I've worked with, I still think that sprint and power performance benefits from caffeine, especially anything that's longer than about 10 seconds. So if you're, if you're a 200 meter or 400 meter sprinter, um, I, I do think the effects of caffeine are, are noticeable. And especially because caffeine is really the main active ingredient in a lot of pre-workouts. People use it for resistance training. So I think the effects as far as enhanced performance in the weight room goes, I think those are clear as well. Now, caffeine does come with more adverse uh, side effects than creatine. It can be addictive, uh, right? And how many of you are hooked on coffee uh, or some other form of caffeine? I know personally, I, if I go a day without caffeine, I'm definitely going to have a headache by the end of the day. So some other adverse effects of caffeine are anxiety, possible gastrointestinal disturbances. Now, you have to take a lot of caffeine uh, or maybe some sour old coffee <laughs> to get those GI disturbances restlessness, insomnia, tremors, heart arrhythmias, increased risk of heat illness, and addiction. So those are serious side effects to consider, and it's important to, I would say, titrate on and off of caffeine. So definitely take the minimal effective dose that gets the er ergogenic aids. Um, and then in periods when you don't need it, just titrate off of it slowly. Don't stop cold turkey, but just slowly lower the, do the dose over the course of a week or two weeks um, and go back off of it. I like to periodize my caffeine intake. So there are certain periods of time when I'm very busy or training very hard where, where I will use it more heavily and then other periods of time where I use it more minimally or even not at all. And I, I recommend that so that you can stay uh, sensitive to it and so that you don't build, up, build and build your tolerance higher and higher. Now pre-workout energy drinks, uh, these come in the form of uh, drinks in a can or you know scoops of something that you put into your shaker bottle. These are effective for increasing resistance training performance. I already mentioned that the primary uh, active ingredient in a lot of these is caffeine. Other types of anaerobic exercise um, is not as responsive to energy drink consumption uh, as resistance training is. So things like uh, wind gate tests or speed and agility performance, not quite as responsive as just pure resistance training. That might be because of the duration of a resistance training session versus that of a shorter duration um, agility session or, or a wind gate test. At least that's what the literature has found. Now there are adverse effects, uh, the same that you find with caffeine, so the same potential side effects. Also, there are often other stimulants in these energy drinks that are not as well researched. And so you could get potential adverse effects from those just because they're not as well researched and they're, and they're always you know, finding new ones in order to continue selling drinks to new customers or to get you reinterested in the drinks like you know now with the brand new like whatever extract from some root that they found in Malaysia and it's not really been tested not to mention that there is a lot of sugar in these drinks now a lot of them are sugar free these days just because of all of the attention that's been put in the whole you know sugary drink anti soda type campaigns but you just have to be a little bit more careful Personally, I prefer just going with, like if I'm going to take caffeine as a pre-workout, I just prefer taking it in a pill form. It's pure caffeine and anhydrous, and you know, I know that there's not other random contaminants in there that I might get in an energy drink. Ephedrine. Uh, ephedrine is effective only when taken in combination with caffeine, or at least, at least that's what the research is saying. Um, it does improve aerobic endurance performance. There are many adverse effects, including death, so ephedrine... I, you know, I can't recommend it. However, we have to know about it as, as strength and conditioning coaches. And it's also banned by most sport governing bodies, including the IOC. So again, this goes in the banned substance category. It's not worth the risk, both from a legality perspective and from uh, the whole like dying perspective. The last one to talk about um, 
is Citrus orontium, and this one's interesting because um, it is thought to contribute to appetite suppression, increased metabolic rate, and lipolysis or, or fat loss. And when combined with caffeine and other herbal products, there are significant improvements in time to fatigue. However, when, when I was researching citrus orontium, I, I found that the evidence was not substantial. Again, just go to like examine.com, look it up for yourself. Um, but it's still on the list of the NCAA's uh, banned performance enhancing drugs. So our college athletes can't take it. All right, guys, we got through it. We got through the list of supplements to talk about from chapter 11, from the essentials of strength training and conditioning textbook. There was a lot in there. We covered ergogenic aids, what they are. We looked at hormones, various types, both uh, anabolic steroids and other hormones. And then we talked about several supplements, dietary supplements. None of what I said is a recommendation to you uh, to go out and buy anything and start taking it or to prescribe it to your athletes. You need to do your own due diligence and consult uh, qualified professionals. This is for informational purposes only. I have a lot of other videos covering the other chapters from the Essentials textbook. So uh, click on over to the playlist and find those there. I'll see you guys on the next video. Oh, it's getting too late. You and me, we're gonna get through this together. This video is brought to you by LaCroix.